Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the War for Badab. The Salamander's captain, Mir Hassan, had been on the way back to Vengeance Station after a successful raid against the secessionist training field in the outer edges of the Maelstrom. A training ground where the tyrant intended to forge an army of degenerate heretical mutant scum into a spear to be hurled at the back of any loyalist advance into the Badab primary sector. It was also a storage yard for much of the stolen gene seed that the Astral Claws had taken from their enemies over the preceding years of the war, and they had also conducted large numbers of highly illegal and heretical experiments upon the human form, tampering with the God Emperor's gene seed, attempting to improve it, to tweak it for a more rapid production of Astartes, and they had also been experimenting with implanting it within the impure host bodies of the mutants found along the edges of the maelstrom. Them. Upon having made this discovery, the mixed salamanders and minotaurs strike force moved immediately to secure all the loyalist gene seed they could, whilst continuing the destruction of all training facilities. Organized resistance having been completely broken hours before by Mirsan's salamanders deep striking into the center of the largest single rallying yard on the planet and breaking the astral claws presence and their vast mutant hordes in a pitched battle. But during their triumphant return from this offensive, the pyre of glory and the light cruiser Admiral Gregorius had been separated from the rest of the fleet during a sudden and violent warp squall. With their geller fields on the very brink of failure, the two ships had chosen to dump themselves back into real space via an emergency re-entry maneuver, and had arrived in an area of space known as the Kala Shoals. It must have appeared like a miracle to the navigators aboard the Admiral Gregorius and the Pyre of Glory to see this one singular calm spot in the raging storm all around them in the Immaterium. But one can raise some questions as to whether or not it was the God Emperor or another entity entirely that was uh, guiding the navigators aboard the two ships. As upon arriving within system, another vessel was swiftly informed about their arrival. The secessionist strike cruiser Hyrcana, who had just days before returned to the planet Shapirus, where it found all of the training yards and the vital experimental gene seed complex upon it destroyed with only the vague warp echoes of a fleet having recently departed the system detectable. The strike cruiser had immediately set off in pursuit of the enemy vessels and had been slipping in and out of the warp periodically to try and maintain the spore. And it was during one of these routine exits that the Pyre of Glory and the Admiral Gregorius was handed onto it on a silver platter. But whatever entity had decided to provide the centurion Karnak Commodus, the leader of the Astral Claws strike cruiser Hyrcania, with his excellent opportunity for vengeance, had not seen fit to cripple his prey for him as well. Both the Pyre of Glory and the Admiral Gregorius had taken a battering. An emergency translation into real space is a very strenuous affair, as all the laws of the material universe suddenly and immediately exert themselves once again upon the ship's frame. Millions of tons of starship suddenly being exposed to all the harsh realities of void travel over the course of a split second. 
extensive programs of emergency repairs and tests would have to be carried out to ensure that both ships were still fully void and warp capable. But these were repairs well within the abilities of the ships to conduct, and their pause here would undoubtedly be a temporary one. But the Centurion did not fancy his chances. A single strike cruiser against a light cruiser and a battle barge, no matter how battered, were long odds. He needed allies, and perhaps the Immaterium might yet provide. It was a risk in such close confines with the two loyalist vessels. Uh, but Karnak Commodus ordered his astropathic choir to begin broadcasting encrypted messages in the hope of finding further allies, preferably other astral claws, perhaps even elements of the raiding forces that the Hurricania had been a part of. Instead, whilst there was a reply, it was from a most unexpected quarter. The Phaeton's Wrath, a flagship battle barge of the Executioner's Chapter, and an accompanying escort of Gladius class frigates. They had been taking on food and water in resupply operations from an uninhabited aquatic world out here in the outer edges of a combat zone, where they were unlikely to be happened upon by loyalists whilst vulnerable in low orbit around the world. Considering the potentially sensitive nature of this operation, I am sure that Centurion and Karnak would have preferred Astral Claw's reinforcements, but none were close enough to lend aid, and the Pyre of Glory and Admiral Gregorius were already showing signs of preparing to light their real space engines and push out towards the nearest translation point. Time was absolutely off the essence, and it was already beginning to run out for the Hyrcania, and so it would take any aid offered to it. And even with the immediate departure of the Executioner's force, they were just barely able to catch the Pyre of Glory and the Admiral Gregorius as they were mere hours away from the translation point placing themselves in between the small loyalist task force and the exit, the two fleets were unavoidably locked into a confrontation. Neither party were particularly happy with the forces arrayed with or against them. For the secessionists, they had a battle barge against a battle barge, and a strike cruiser and a handful of Gladius class frigates against a light cruiser. A slight advantage, but nowhere near enough to guarantee victory. As for the Loyalists, whilst they were not all that much outmatched in terms of sheer void firepower, the enemy had far more Astartes, making boarding actions the primary threat to the Loyalist vessels. Everything was thusly set for a long-term, grueling void engagement, where the Loyalists would wish to outmaneuver or break through the secessionist forces, gain space, head towards the translation point, and then make an emergency entry into the warp, a hazardous maneuver under fire as the Void Shields, the primary protection against enemy lance and bombardment weaponry, would have to be lowered so that the Geller fields could be brought up in their place to shield them from the warp instead. But as the old truism goes, no plan ever survives contact with the enemy. And in this case, neither did the Admiral Gregorius. Shields up, fully prepared for an attack, and steaming ahead with weapon batteries at the ready, the Gregorius simply exploded. And whilst the Gregorius was a light cruiser, that designation does not refer to the fact that the ship was constructed primarily from soaked paper mache, and so something had clearly gone horribly wrong. Despite the near unified attention of the secessionist fleet, a light cruiser is still equipped with multiple void shields and meter thick layers of ablative armor. It doesn't just simply go boom because of one round of firing. But 
the vessel had conducted an emergency exit from the wharf. The crew had undoubtedly carried out whatever checks they could, but in the trying circumstances they may simply have made a mistake. Perhaps the void shields were not up to full power. Perhaps one of the void shield emitters was down. Perhaps the armor plating had been ruptured more severely than originally estimated. Regardless of the reason, the very first volley of lance batteries fired from the secessionists slashed right through her void shields, her armor, and directly into her primary plasma reactor turning the Admiral Gregorius into a miniature supernova, leaving the pyre of glory alone at the none too tender mercies of the Hyrcania and the Phaeton's wrath. There is always a silver lining, however, as the two aforementioned secessionist warships now decided that they had an excellent opportunity to gain another secessionist warship by boarding and capturing the Pyre of Glory. Boarding torpedoes were soon streaking through the void towards the Salamander's battle barge. Easily hammering through its outer hull, they disgorged combat squads inside of the Pyre, which immediately headed towards the command bridge and engine arm. But of course, boarding an Adeptus Astartes battle barge is no easy task as the interior is as much of a defensive measure as the ship's armor and void shields. Constructed like a fortress, countless choke points, armored hallways and blast doors protected kilometers of narrow corridors, which could at any moment be filled with the devastating heat of Promethean flamethrowers, scorching even Astartes' power armor. Once the initial boarding points had been located, Devastator squads were dispatched to nearby choke points. Others were sealed by meter-thick blast doors, and the Astral Claws and Executioner's boarding parties soon found themselves completely cut off. They could not advance for fear of running headfirst into automated heavy weapon batteries or Devastator squads armed with heavy flamethrowers and bolters. Nor could they stay put as squads of fire drake terminators roamed the halls with roaring assault cannons. Time and time again, the secessionists attempted to forge out from their beachheads to break through and into the wider ship where they could do some real damage. But always they were met by the fire drakes, with lightning claws, storm shields, and thunder hammers, and thrown right back into their confines. Where at any time they could be attacked from any direction, as the ship itself seemingly turned on the secessionists, allowing the salamanders to run around them and strike from passageways unmolested, whilst all the secessionists could do was hunker down in whatever cover remained to them, praying they could respond swiftly enough to the next attack. After repeated attempts, it was clear that the boarding action was becoming untenable, and the force itself was risking annihilation at the hands of the salamanders, and so it was called off and the secessionists withdrew back into their boarding pods and abandoned the attempt on the Pyre of Glory. Seemingly denied their prize, at least for the time being, the two secessionist warships drew away from the Pyre of Glory and redoubled their efforts to cripple it instead. What followed was a three and a half hour long void engagement with the two sides constantly jockeying for position, the Hyrcana and the Phaeton's Wrath trying to soak up the most of the Pyre of Glory's weapon battery's fire, splashing it harmlessly across their own void shields, whilst jockeying to get behind the Pyre, overwhelm her shields, and strike her primary engine blocks. 
for the captains of both sides. It was a difficult and almost delicate dance, as the warships continuously tried to at once keep themselves out of the enemy's guns and avoid a focused bombardment, whilst also simultaneously absorbing enough of the enemy's firepower and attention to keep it away from the softer elements of the secessionist strike force. On at least two occasions, however, the Pyre of Glory's captain managed to outwit his secessionist foes. With unpredictable maneuvers, he caught two of the frigates right in his gun sights and destroyed them both. The small, weakly armored and shielded patrol crafts, no match for the Salamander Battle Barge's massive lance batteries. But eventually, slowly but surely, the enemy strike cruiser and battle barge whittled away at the void shields of the Pyre of Glory. Every time a shield fell, extensive backwash of energy would surge through the ship, blowing out conduits and causing damage to the primary engine drives and the shield manifest. As the damage slowly began to mount, it became ever more imperative that the Pyre of Glory keep its heavily armored prow facing towards the secessionist warships, so that the meters of armor could soak up any shot that snuck through the void shields whilst they were cycling. But outnumbered by two vessels of near equal tonnage and firepower, plus a horde of stinging, snapping frigates, it was but a question of time. Until finally, the Phaeton's Wrath managed to slip in momentarily behind the Pyre of Glory, overwhelm its void shields, and blow a significant portion of its massive engine block clean off the ship. Reduced to but a fraction of its total propulsion, and relying on maneuver jets now more than engine power, the Pyre of Glory was dead in the void. And soon, the Hyrcania and the Phaeton's Wrath moved in above and below the vessel, broadside batteries ready to gut and stave its skull in simultaneously. It looked like Captain Mirasan's glorious raid would end with a far higher price than Carib Cullen would have ever wished to pay. And then, a very unexpected Vox signal chimed out across the bridge of the Pyre of Glory. The Executioner's warship was hailing them on an open frequency. Pelas Mirsan accepted the communique, and was greeted with the voice of Thulsa Kane, Lord Executioner and Chapter Master of the Executioner's Chapter. What he was doing out here in the middle of nowhere, so far away from the Night Hag, is anyone's guess, but he offered Pelas Mirsan the opportunity to surrender, and not merely as prisoners of war of the secessionists, but as honorable combatants. They would be guaranteed safe passage from the war zone so long as Mirisan, his crew, and his company gave their oaths to not take any further active part in the conflict. This was quite the departure from the Executioner's usual reputation of absolute merciless, murderous violence, but it might also give us some indication as to why Thulza Cain found himself here so far away from the front lines. Maybe the executioners figured that their honor-bound duty had been done, and now that the war was practically over, they would continue the odd pinprick here and there as honor demanded, but they would take no further part in an open conflict. And so now that they had been forced into a direct fight with loyalist Astartes, Maybe Cain was simply looking for a less bloody way out. Because there was certainly none of this happy, lucky, fluffy, fluffy mercy when he was engaging the Minotaurs. Then again, 
I somehow doubt the boys in bronze uh, would have made the same offer either. Regardless, it took Palas Mersan a bit by surprise, and his command staff immediately urged him to refuse the offer, stating that there was no way the secessionists who had proven themselves again and again, and most thoroughly so during this recent action, to be duplicitous and untrustworthy. In all due likelihood, they would simply harvest their gene seed and toss their corpses from the nearest airlock, they argued. But Mirasan had served alongside the Executioner's chapter centuries ago as a mere scout neophyte, and he had been very impressed then with their efficiency and honor, and so he decided to trust their word. Due to this personal anecdote, 200 years old, I will now risk all of you being tortured and murdered. Lay down your arms, comrades. Nothing bad can possibly come from this. <laughs> well, it would turn out he was right, but nevertheless, it's amusing. Empire of Glory agreed to stand down its guns and also begin the process of surrendering their arms so as to receive free passage. The Phaeton's Wrath and the Hyrcania both drew up alongside the pyre and began sending over boarding parties to facilitate the surrender process, with Thulsa Cain himself going to the bridge where he received Mirasan's sword in surrender. But the Astral Claws, of course, had another objective. They had been just as wrong-footed by this offer as the Salamanders had. Centurion Commodus knew perfectly well what was likely to be aboard the Pyre of Glory, not just the gene seed stock from his previous base, but also quite likely a significant stock of Salamanders gene seed as well both from the preceding action and over the course of potentially the entire campaign, as each and every gene seed recovered or brought to full fruition during the campaign was likely to be stored aboard the Pyre of Glory. And so whilst Thulsa Cain had headed directly for the bridge, he had headed straight towards the ship's apothecarium where he demanded that they unseal the gene seed waltz and give him access to everything inside, something the ship's apothecaries, of course, refused outright, to the point of wrestling with the astral claws and trying to physically keep them away from the inner sanctums. At this point, the salamanders had already laid down their arms and officially surrendered, but presumably, naturally, the promise of safe passage would include everything aboard the ship, obviously including the sacred gene seed. But Commodus had a very different interpretation and was rapidly running out of patience. And so when another apothecary stepped out to block his way to the gene seed vault, he simply took out his power sword and stabbed it into the apothecary's belly twisting it to open the wound, and as the dying Astarte slid off his blade, he raised a hand to activate his throat mic and issued the order to kill all the salamanders. Surrender be damned. The Astral Claws were seizing this ship with force. And as the Claws began slaughtering the helpless crew of the Pyre of Glory, Panicked Vox communications were streaming into the bridge and played aloud over the loudspeakers where Thulsa Kane and Captain Mirsan were just now carrying out the surrender protocols. Mirsan immediately feared that he had made a catastrophic error of judgment in trusting the executioners. But the look of cold fury and disbelief that crossed the face of Thulsa Kane in front of him told him that maybe there was a way out of this. Putting on his haughtiest expression, staring down his nose at Thulsa Cain, he spat the words. The executioners had lost all 
honor. They had sided now with a chapter that slaughter unarmed space marines after surrender had been offered and accepted, purely so that they could desecrate a chapter's most sacred relics like they had done before in the training ground they had just burned. The executioners were in league with heretical mutant worshippers. What absolute unfaithful refuse had the executioners turned into under Thulsa Cain's command to stand by and watch such disgraceful horror be committed in his presence by his allies? There was another brief moment there. Captain Mirsan thought that he might have pushed it a little bit too far and saw his life pass before his reddish eyes um, as Falsa Kane, virtually radiating with fury and about to strike the captain down where he stood with his axe, spun on his heel and marched from the brig while speaking frantic clipped orders into his own vox speed. And it didn't take long for other executioners scattered throughout the ship to confirm what Kane had already heard on the command bridge. Captain Mirasan, meanwhile, was relieved that he still had a head on his shoulders, and soon was made aware of the rapidly changing situation across the ship as well. The repeated calls for aid and report of the Astral Claw's treachery were swiftly replaced with baffled descriptions of Executioner's combat squads falling upon the Astral Claws everywhere across the ship, butchering them mercilessly before the Claws even knew what was happening. Realizing that his gambit had succeeded, Merisan ordered all salamanders to immediately arm themselves with whatever was at hand, and then rally back towards the Pyre of Glory's central sanctum, deep within the bowels of the ship, where Merisan intended to release the Dreadnoughts, to rampage through the corridors and lend aid to the executioners wherever they could. Soon renewed heavy fighting was taking place all along the length of the Pyre of Glory, leading towards the boarding points established into the Hyrcania, the Salamander's dreadnoughts drenching the narrow corridors in Stormbolter and Promethean Flame, whilst occasionally also being assaulted and overwhelmed by the Astral Claws. The three dreadnoughts that had survived the violent action down on the training prison planet were now engaged yet again with the Astral Claws were proven so very adept at destroying them, and several more would be laid to their final rest before this day was over. But clearly, caught by complete surprise and in shock at the apparent betrayal of the executioners, the Astral Claws suffered heavy casualties in the initial minutes of the engagement, before beginning to fall back slowly towards the Hyrcania, probably intending to board their strike cruiser again and light engines in an escape attempt. Meanwhile, the Salamanders were more interested in getting the Hyrcania detached from their own vessel so that they could try and leave this newfound war between previous enemies. Pushing towards the docking joints, they came across several corpses of their once brothers, pointedly with their necks torn open and their gene seed removed. Apparently, the Centaurian Commodus had not merely contented himself with breaking into the Pyre of Glory's Gene Seed Vault to reclaim that which he believed to have been stolen along with the Salamander's own Gene Seed, he had also begun slaughtering the unarmored Salamanders and ripping it from their still warm flesh. I imagine the hot-blooded nature of the Sons of Vulcan were beginning to come to the fore out about this point. But by the time they reached the docking clamps leading into the Hyrcania, and Mirasan perhaps braced himself to try and retain control so as to not have them charge across, 
All they found was a blood-soaked corridor leading over to the strike cruiser with the torn and battered bodies of executioners and astral claws alike strewn about it leading in to the darkened chambers of the strike cruiser. It would appear that the executioners had gotten to the Hyrcania before it could successfully detach. The grisly scene was such that it gave the salamanders pause, and instead of trying to cross over into the Hyrcania or blow open the docking ports, they chose instead to withdraw back to the sanctuary at the heart of the Pyre of Glory. Even as the Hyrcania was bathed in the blood of everyone aboard, not just the Astral Claws, but the crew, the serfs, the naval armsmen, every last living thing was torn apart limb by limb, and those who tried to surrender ritualistically decapitated by the executioners. Blissfully unaware, as far as they could after seeing the corridor, the salamanders aboard the Pyre of Glory fortified their inner sanctum and waited for whatever to return from that battle. After just over an hour, a single power-armored individual came walking out of the darkness of the ship towards the sanctuary gates and was met by Captain Mirasan. The individual was Thulsa Kane himself, the chief executioner of the chapter. He did not utter a single word, but slowly reached up to unfasten his helmet, remove it, and kneel down before Mirasan. He then presented a ragged-looking, battered, fleshy object the head of Centurion Commodus, the commander of the Astral Claws aboard the Hyrcania. But Sir Kane then slowly rose back onto his feet, turned around and marched into the darkness of the Pyre of Glory once more. Oh, what a joy it would have been to have had a deeper look into Mirasan's thoughts at that point. My money would be on an unusual blend of relief and mild confusion as to what exactly had happened and what was going to happen next. We, luckily, do know. Thulsa Kane, upon receiving the confirmed reports that the Astral Claws were indeed slaughtering the defenseless salamanders and trying to break into their gene seed vault, had renounced the executioner's blood oath to the Astral Claws as they had proven themselves to be undoubtedly as nefarious and heretical as the loyalists would have them believe and that the shame of siding with such a chapter could only be washed away in blood and violence. As for the taciturn way he treated Captain Mirsan in the aftermath, the executioners undoubtedly felt a great weight of shame on their shoulders after their actions, and no apology would suffice to allay the salamander's suspicion of them, nor would any apology ever be sufficient to make up for the heinous crimes of the Astral Claws in attempting to rob the salamanders of their most precious commodities. Yet, clearly, as demonstrated by Thulsa Kane, a display of, if not apology, then repentance was required. Hence, the head of Centurion Commodus. Afterwards, the executioners quietly, without any further comment, detached their ship from the power of glory and withdrew, leaving the salamander's vessel still attached to the now blood-soaked mess of the Hyrcania. <laughs> it speaks, sir. Uh, volumes about the nature of the executioners 
that the salamanders did not even consider trying to take the vessel as a prize and bring it back to Vengeance Station, bearing in mind that right now the Hyrcania was more void and warp-worthy than the Pyre of Glory, and could easily have been operated with a skeleton crew. And yet it was left behind as a tomb ship to drift forever through the void, or however long it took the Denzians of the Maelstrom to discover it, anywho. <laughs> I have a sneaking suspicion that the Hyrcania's career as a raider is far from over. In contrast, however, the Executioner's careers as pirates in the Autonomous Zone ceased almost overnight with Thulsa Cain declaring that the Astral Claws were traitors, no longer worthy of the Executioner's chapter's loyalty or aid. Though whilst the Loyalists' rear-line echelons could rest easy, there were still violent encounters with the Executioner's happening on and off through the Autonomous Zone. These occurred not as a system of organized attacks against the Loyalists launched by the Executioners, but rather as a result of the two sides not having the slightest whiff of trust in one another. The Executioners had technical orders to not engage the Loyalists unless provoked or threatened, and the Loyalists had something mildly similar eventually. But what constituted a threat was often liberally interpreted. The most standout example being when the Sons of Medusa strike cruiser, the Warp Spite, entered into the Grief system near simultaneously with an executioner strike force, with both sides viewing the other as ambushing them and opening fire immediately. The Sons of Medusa's strike cruiser gave as good as it got, but heavily outnumbered, it was eventually crippled and sunk with all hands aboard. Such actions also yet further confused Loyalist command, as they had yet not heard back from Captain Mirisan and the Pyre of Glory. Indeed, the ship was expected to have been lost in the violent warp squalls that had separated it from the rest of the task force. The Minotaur's chaplain had long since already returned, and essentially reported that the pyre had most likely been destroyed, either in the warp storm or by enemy action thereafter. No one, not even Carab Cullen, therefore, made the leap of logic to connect the disappearance of the Pyre of Glory with the sudden and unexpected secession of raiding activity by the Executioners, particularly as they still demonstrated no real hesitance to engage in openly hostile actions against Loyalist fleets. The puzzling situation was only explained several months thereafter, as the crippled, barely void capable pyre of glory translated into the system, and opened communication lines with Vengeance Station, identifying itself as the last remnants of the Salamander Strike Force dispatched nearly half a year earlier. And even after Captain Mirsan had been fully debriefed, the actions of the Executioners only seemed slightly less random. Well, on the bright side, they weren't striking out against Loyalist shipping lines, and so long as the Loyalists could keep a healthy distance from the Executioners, they seemed primarily interested now in striking out against the Astral Claws. This too was a double catastrophe for the tyrant. Not only had his last allied chapter been taken from him, but they had been turned into active enemies unlike the Mantis Warriors and the Lamenters. And the Executioners of course, having operated alongside the Secessionists now for years, had intimate knowledge of the various hidden supply dumps survey stations, and spy outposts scattered throughout the Autonomous Zone. Any hopes that Lufthuron may have had for a counter-attack 
or an evacuation of Badab Primaris by breaking through the encirclement were now completely quashed. Not merely by the destruction of the training yards, but by the executioner's near encyclopedic understanding of all of his bolt holes, all of his reserves, all of his supply points, all of his naval berths, etc., etc., etc. The executioners had gone from being the tyrant's last allies to his greatest enemies. But whilst the tyrant was flinging furniture around in the Palace of Thorns, on Vengeance Station, it was all a celebration. Carab Cullen had resigned himself to the loss of one of his most trusted lieutenants in Captain Mirsan. But with his return, and the news of the executioner's shift in loyalties, and the destruction of the training yards, Carab Cullen now found himself with his back clear, and all his allies gathered in singular purpose. Finally, the offensive against Badab could commence, and an end to the war was in sight. Until next time. I have been Arch, thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon as we enter into the final chapters of The War for Badab. Have a good day.